Good morning. Um, Great to be here with you guys. You guys can open up to the book of Galatians with me this morning. We'll be looking at chapter one. And I am totally blessed to be here and to be able to uh, just share with you guys from what the Lord has just really been pouring into me this last uh, week in my studies. And you know, usually when I get up here and share, I, I, you know, there's a lot of prayer goes into it and a lot of thought. And I usually pick a, you know, some type of topical type of message to share with you guys, which are definitely the most difficult. Um, but the Lord just totally put it in my heart to start a book, you know, with you. And especially uh, with my dad leaving out to the mission field, Lord willing, out to Sudan, um, you know, we will be, uh, we'll be doing this a little bit more, right? So I just thought it'd be neat to be able to start a book and hey, if the Lord leads one day to be able to complete that book with you uh, in his timing. And then uh, as he said also, we will have different teachers come in as well, some guys from outside of the church also. So I'm totally looking forward to that um, as well. So, all right, Galatians chapter one. Uh, This morning, we're going to be reading uh, about grace and what grace is and how it pertains to our lives. And, you know, one easy way that I could try to explain grace to you would be this. You know, you're driving down the freeway at your normal, you know, 85 speed, you know, that you're going, right? You get pulled over by the police officer. And if the police officer lets you go, that's mercy, okay? You should have got the ticket, but he let you go. That's mercy. But if he gives you the ticket and he gives you the court date and you show up in court in front of that judge... And the judge ends up not dismissing the ticket, but paying the fine for you. That is grace, right? He is giving from his own riches, from his own wallet, basically, to pay for uh, the expense that it would take for your ticket. And that's kind of what grace is. Grace, the acronym for it, is God's riches at Christ's expense. There is a payment that needed to be made and uh, the Lord didn't just dismiss it, though he probably could have. He's God. He could do anything he wants. But he actually decided to pay that payment that was due. And, uh, and Galatians 1 and really the whole book is all about this grace. So let's go ahead and let's read verse 1 and 2 really quick and then we'll pray. Verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me. Let's pray. Father, we lift up this morning to you, Lord, and God, we are just so thankful to be here, to be in a place, God, that we have total peace, total uh, just tranquility, Lord, where we can sit down at your feet and worship and praise you through song. God, that we can sit at your feet now, Lord, and just open up your word and get into the scriptures that were written specifically to us. We thank you, God, that in the chaos of this world, that you desire to meet with us, Lord, and you desire to impart your grace to us. And Father, we pray this morning that you would make that grace real and known in our lives, that you would define what grace is to us, that grace would be known and it would be real uh, within our attitudes, within our spirit, God, just in, in, in every part of our being, Father, that we would know exactly what the meaning of grace is. And Father, we pray as we get into the book of Galatians, Lord, that, we would, uh, that you would reveal and give us understanding to Paul's writings as he wrote to uh, the churches there in that region at that time, that, Lord, it would still apply completely to our lives this day. Father, we just uh, once again thank you for this morning, Lord, and we lift all this up in your name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1 and 2, let's read it again. It says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. The word grace there, uh, again, is a very important word. It's a very important doctrine that we find throughout the Bible. And really the book of Galatians is in and of itself as well a very neat little book, a very important book. Uh, In the Greek, the book is called Pros Galatas or To the Galatians, To Those in Galatia. And it's Neat. It's a neat book because it is Paul's only letter or epistle that was written not to an individual, 
not to a specific person like a Timothy or a Titus or the book of Philemon. And and it wasn't written to a specific church like uh, maybe Corinthians, but it was the only letter that Paul wrote that was to a region, to a complete area, to multiple churches, and really not even just the churches there, but to all the believers that were in Galatia, the area of Galatia. It's kind of like writing a letter to those in Southern California, right? To those in Southern California, you know, or to those in Los Angeles or Riverside, not to a specific church or person, but to an entire people. And this to me tells me that this is a very broad issue that Paul is writing about, right? It's not a specific problem that is found once again in a church or in a family, but it is a broad issue that is something that many, many believers even, people that have come to the Lord, are dealing with. And absolutely still applies even to us this day. And it's such an important little book, so important that Paul thought that everybody in the area should read this book, read this letter, copy it, pass it around, read it with your families, give it to the next church, and just allow everybody to read it that has ever accepted Jesus Christ. One thing about the book of Galatians is it is written to those that have accepted Jesus Christ. It's written to the church. And Paul's first missionary journey through the region of Galatia is found in the book of Acts chapter 13 and 14. And I totally encourage you to uh, study the word of God, first of all, on your own, but study it in a way that it makes sense, that explains itself to you. And one way to do that is as you're reading through the epistles, through Galatians and Colossians and Ephesians and Philippians and all these awesome books is to read it alongside the book of Acts because it gives you such a neat understanding as to why all of these epistles were even written. Why Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Why? Because what we find in in Acts chapter 13 and 14. What happened when he was there in Galatia? What happened when he was in that region and with the churches and with the believers? And it just totally gives you great insight and understanding. And as you read the book of Acts, you find a lot of mixed success with Paul as he's out ministering to people. And uh, let's go ahead and read verse one and two again of Galatians chapter one. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. And I love how Paul just starts his letter here. He starts it the same as he starts most of his letters, but a little bit different. He adds there in verse two, he says, and and all the brethren who are with me. All the brethren who are with me. Paul adds here in the book of Galatians that this is not a letter written just from him. This isn't just some idea that Paul came up with, you know, some opinion or encouragement that he would have for the people there in Galatia. But this is a complete joint effort that was from Paul and from the brethren that were there in the area. You know, he definitely would have had a lot of faithful disciples or followers by this point in his ministry. He was ministering to the region there on his missionary journeys for about 10 years now. He definitely would have had his, uh, his faithful disciple Luke with him, right? As Luke traveled around and, and uh, uh, there with Paul. And it's neat to see that this was a cohesive group, a group that was in agreement with Paul. And Paul wasn't just some lone ranger out there, you know, trying to go around and just correct the church, trying to go around and tell everyone, you know, how bad of a job they're doing and, you know, to shape up and all that. You know, Paul was a man that had that spiritual support. He had that team that, was, that he was a part of. And in Proverbs 13, verse 20, it says, he who walks with wise men will be wise. He who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. How important it is to walk with wise men and women, right? Walk with wise men, not a wise guy. Don't walk with the wise guy. Walk with wise men, right? And the Bible says there in Proverbs that you will be wise. You will be wise. But also it says that the companion of fools will be destroyed, will be destroyed. And I think too many times that a believer's life 
or relationship with the Lord or Christianity is destroyed because they have no godly companionship. They have no godly encouragement and the only companionship that they have is really found in the world. The encouragement and the support that they have is found with non-believers. And in Proverbs, it gives us that warning that, hey, walk with those that are unwise, walk with the world and eventually you'll be destroyed. But walk with the wise and you'll be lifted up. And this was Paul. This is where he was at here in the book of Galatians as he writes from the fellow believers. Let's read verses three through five. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Here Paul states where it is his words or this topic of conversation is coming from again it's important to note that this is not paul's opinions and this is not uh, also the uh you know an opinion of the group there that it's not a voted on legislation you know something that they all came up with and and conjured up to go ahead and encourage people in the region this is honesty straight from the bible straight from the word of god straight from the heart of god and you can deny the bible all you want You can argue with the Bible and the doctrine of the Bible and the truth of the Bible, but know that all you're doing is arguing straight with God and you're fighting a losing battle. And I think if you're honest with yourself, you'll admit, man, this is truth. If truth exists, this has to be it. And this truth was sent to deliver us, right? That's the neat thing about the word of God is that it only has good intentions, Isn't that neat to think about? The Bible only has good intentions. There's no bad intentions that that we find in the Bible. There's no evil that the Lord wishes upon us. It says that he doesn't even, you know, he doesn't even uh, take joy or or he's not even happy about uh, the destruction of the wicked. There's absolutely no ill will from the word of God. All it is is acceptance and grace and, and that desire for peace that we find within this Bible. Let's read verses six through 10, turning from grace. It says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Underline that scripture there, circle that scripture. This is the purpose for Paul writing the book of Galatians. Why did Paul write the book of Galatians? Why do we have the book of Galatians? What is the book of Galatians about? Verse six of chapter one, he tells you right away. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed." As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For I do not persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. As Paul went to the area of Galatia here, religious men almost immediately came down into the region and began to turn uh, people, men and women's hearts, back away from that doctrine of grace. And really turning them away from the Lord is what they were doing. That salvation is by grace alone, through faith, and not by works. And in Acts chapter 14, Paul the Apostle, uh, in speaking to the multitudes there in the area of Galatia, we find the account, you don't have to turn there, but um, it says that men came down immediately to poison their minds to poison their minds and as the crowds became divided some end up wanting to even hurt violently turn against Paul and the disciples there and I'll read the account to you it's found in Acts chapter 14 and it says this now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews speaking of Paul and the apostles and so spoke that a great multitude of the Jews and the Greeks believed But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly 
in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews their, uh, with their rulers to abuse and stone them, speaking of Paul, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Iconia and to the surrounding region. There was an immediate pushback to the doctrine of grace. Immediately, there becomes men that stand up against the doctrine of grace. Satan absolutely hates the idea that we are free men and women able to worship and serve the Lord, not in bondage to him or to anything. He hates that idea. You know, that God's salvation came as a free gift and that there's nothing that we have to do to obtain it. There's nothing that we can do even to gain more favor even with God. And Satan's whole plan only works if we're in bondage to him. If he can keep us in that bondage. And he'll even lie to us and make us think that even if we are, you know, seeking after God, he'll make us think, oh, you're seeking after God. When in reality, we're still in bondage to the lie of the enemy. And we're still in bondage to Satan and to his lies. And so the Galatians, as they received this free gift, as Paul went around again to the region and spoke of salvation through Christ, through the work of the cross, immediately these religious men came to keep them in the bondage of works. And immediately... It says that Paul, I mean, he's just, Paul's just amazed at how quickly they turned back, how quickly they gave up that freedom that they found in the Lord, that grace that they found in the Lord to go back to the law, to the men that said, you must, you must follow the law. You must keep the Sabbath holy. You must be circumcised. You must follow the feast. You must Give a certain amount. You must, you must, you must sacrifice for forgiveness. And if the enemy can't convince you that there is no God, the next thing that he'll try to do is convince you that God is powerless. He might not be able to convince you that there is no God, just like those that came down into Galatia. But the very next thing that he'll try to do if he can't convince you that there is no God is that he'll try to convince you that God is powerless. Okay, there is a God, but he sure can't save you all on his own. He, can't sure, he surely can't just save you with the cross, with no you know, other requirements. There has to be other requirements. And the attacks might not be as obvious as these men coming down into Galatia and wanting to stone and murder Paul and the apostles. It might be, you know, a, a, a little more hidden. It might be, it might come in the form of, you know, friends or family constantly uh, fighting against our faith in the Lord. And, you know, you're nuts, you're crazy. It might come in the form of teachers or coworkers always fighting against our faith or even religious people taking our focus off of what God has done for us and trying to place our focus on what we have to do or what we can do. You know, one way or another, the enemy is going to try to get us to believe that there is no God. And if he can't get us to turn away from God, he'll definitely try to get us to turn away from his saving grace. He'll try to get us to turn away from that salvation that is free, that we're saved by God's grace, period, period. Nothing else that has to be done. You don't have to do anything. There's nothing that you can even do. Do. In verse 9, read it with me. Paul says, If anyone preaches, in chapter 1 of Galatians, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. He says, If you've already, or that you have already received this truth, don't allow the lies of the enemy to come in and turn you from what you've already received in Jesus. And that's exactly what was going on in Galatia. That's exactly what they were battling with. You know, you were saved, but now it just seems too easy. You're saying we're saved, Paul, but man, there has to be more. 
There has to be something else that I have to do. You know, man will always look for something that is tangible, right? We'll always look for something that is physical that we can see or touch or feel. And that's why idols or idolatry is so prevalent. You go into the majority of the world and in different cultures and there is such an importance placed on idols and statues and shrines even. You know, for my job, I go into a lot of homes and uh, a a lot of um, Asian cultures. If you go into one of the rooms, this is their prayer room. And, And a lot of the homes, they have all the shrines set up and the candles and the idols. And man, it just feels so creepy for me to even be in there, you know? I just want to go and just like, you know, knock it all over and then just like walk out and like, I don't know, I didn't do it, you know? It's just like so weird. And, you know, we always look for that tangible thing. And, you know, for the Christian, for the believer, it could be the same as, you know, well, I got to go to church today because I need to be forgiven. What? You've already been forgiven, You've already accepted salvation and, and, and that free gift of grace, you know, from the Lord. You don't have to go to church to be forgiven. You don't have to do anything. It turns from I have to to I get to, right? Hey, I get to go to church. I get to hear about God's grace. I get to worship the Lord. And it becomes a, a thing that, is, that has to be done to, to a thing that is just joyful, you know, and, and, and that we just get to, uh, that we just feel honored to even be a part of. Paul says, let those men be accursed, those that teach these lies. And I can totally understand where the Jews are coming from. You know, sometimes we, 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 we judge those in the Bible, I think, a little too, too harshly. You know, I heard a pastor say the other day on K-Wave that a lot of pastors are going to owe uh, uh, the, Paul the Apostle a lot of, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, they're going to have to ask for his for- forgiveness, basically, for all the messages that they've told about Paul and how many times he stuck his foot in his mouth. We just jump to judgments on a lot of, you know, people within the Bible, including, you know, the Ju- these Jews that came down and started preaching the tradition of the law. This was a tradition that was in their family from the beginning of time. This was uh, their religion that was passed down from generation to generation that started out in a correct way. And, and you know, I can totally understand how they didn't want to give up those family traditions. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that we have a new family now. They have a new family now. We have new traditions that we find within the Lord. And we should be so ready and willing to give up the things of the old man, Right? We should be so willing to give up the things of the past, the things that we used to love to do because now we have a new family. Now God gives us new tradition and a new covenant that we find in him. Let's read verse 11 through 17. Enemies of grace. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard from my former conduct in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being uh, more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So Paul says that this gospel of salvation isn't something that he mysteriously stumbled upon. It's not something that he figured out, you know, over time and and through all of his studies. It's not something that he had to travel, you know, to a land far, far away and climb up a thousand stairs, you know, and, and find that old man that was just able to give him that, you know, wisdom here. This is something that was freely given to Paul, freely revealed through Jesus by the revelation of Jesus. It was revealed by God straight to Paul. It was a truth that was even spoken of since the beginning of time. You know, a lot of times we think that God's grace is, oh, it's found in the New Testament, you know, and it's the new covenant, yes, but it was in the works from the very beginning. 
You know, yes, uh, you know, there's a group of us that are all going through, you know, our devotionals together and we're going through the word and we meet once a week. And it's so neat because as we go through the Old Testament, it's so neat to see that every story we come upon points straight to Jesus, points to the cross and to salvation and to that sacrifice that the Lord had to make. Yes, it's, you know, uh, you know, the grace is under the new covenant, but it's been in the works from the very beginning. And it was on the road to Damascus that the Lord revealed this truth to Paul, that he just gave it to him. Paul didn't have to do anything for it. God just gave it to him, you know? And, uh, and, and, and on this road, we see that Paul, as he's going to Damascus, he gets a letter even from the high priest in Jerusalem to go and to bind Christians and to bring them back to uh, Jerusalem to face imprisonment. And we see that when you take your eyes off of grace, you get caught up in the works of the flesh. You're either in the spirit or you're in the flesh, one or the other. And every day we should be uh, looking at ourselves and examining our heart to figure out, am I in the flesh today or in this situation or am I in the spirit because you're in one or the other in the book of Galatians we'll get into all of this and we even find the fruits of the spirit right in Galatians 5 and before the fruits of the spirit we find the works of the flesh and a lot of times we memorize the fruits of the spirit but it's interesting to see that you can actually go back and examine your heart within the first few verses before that even to see am I in the flesh We're in either one or the other. And the more that we take our eyes off of grace, the more we get caught up in the flesh. And this is exactly what Paul was doing. Paul should have been going to Damascus to preach God. He was a believer in God. He should have been going to teach truth. But instead he was going for punishment, for judgment, to condemn. This is the heart that the law and the flesh brings. Galatians 1.13, he said, speaking of Paul, I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Verse 14, and I have advanced and I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being, mu- uh, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Not zealous for the Lord, Paul doesn't say I became exceedingly zealous for the Lord. Not zealous for justification and a restored relationship with God. Not zealous to preach the God of the Israelites. He was exceedingly zealous for the traditions of his fathers. Straight from his mouth. Traditions. Traditions are distractions. Traditions are uh, enemies of grace. They're enemies of grace. And Paul even says that in his, as his zealousness grew, the more zealous he became, the more uh, the persecution for the church grew. So the more zealous he became for traditions and for the law, the more that it hurt the church. The more the church suffered. Traditions of prayers, traditions of works, traditions of giving, traditions of fill in the blank, even going to church on Sunday. These can all become traditions. And the more that traditions grow within our lives and within our hearts, the more that the church will suffer, believe it or not. The more that a a heart that is full of condemnation will begin to grow inside of us. You know, whatever it is that you have your eyes on hurts the church and is an enemy of grace if it's not Jesus Christ and the cross. If it's not the grace of God. You know, well, we just need more ministries. We just need to get these things going. No, we just need more Jesus. You know, we just need to get America great again, you know, and and get back on the right track. No, we just need more Jesus in this country. We get our eyes off of the Lord and we get our eyes onto the things that are tangible, the things that are physical that we can see. And the more time spent doing things is more time spent away from our relationship with Jesus. It's that Martha and Mary dilemma, right? Do we clean and scrub the floors and get the place prepared or do we sit at Jesus' feet and just say, Lord, pour into me. 
I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. There will always be enemies of grace. But the biggest threat is thinking that we've obtained anything through works. Anything at all. You know, a lot of times we do things and unknowingly we're doing them for the wrong reason. The Bible says that even our good works are like filthy rags, right? Why? Because a lot of times when I do something good, what do I do? You know, there's something on the, and I bend down to pick it up. I, I look around first, right? Who's what? Hey, you know, and we, let me, yeah, I got it. No, no, I got it. It's okay. You know? And we look around and no one's there and what? Oh, okay. And we just keep walking, you know, right by it. Someone else will get it. The Bible says our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Nothing is gained through works. And it was in God's perfect timing that he revealed this truth to Paul. This is what's so neat about this. In God's perfect timing, it became real to Paul. And in, perfect, and in God's perfect timing, everybody, everything that is an enemy of grace will have to be faced with the truth of grace. And it will do one of two things. It will either one, draw you closer to the freedom that is found in grace as it did Paul or it will too push you more into bondage under the law as it did to those in Galatia. Verse 18 through 24, changed by grace. Read with me. It says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and and, uh, Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea who were in Christ. But they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. Paul was changed by grace. Paul was completely changed. He was a new man. He was a new creation in this newfound grace in Jesus Christ. You guys might know the story of Stephen, right? Remember that story? Stephen was a neat guy. Uh, Uh, The Bible says that he was a man that was full of grace and power. And the story of Stephen is found again in the book of Acts, chapter six and seven. And it says that as uh, a tumult, as a a crowd begins to rise up against the Lord and against the believers, it says that Stephen begins to uh, preach the gospel to them. And as Stephen is preaching the gospel to them, Stephen becomes the first martyr that is found in the book of Acts, right? They end up killing, murdering Stephen. And who is there to give his approval? Anyone remember? Saul, right? Paul, a.k.a. Saul. And Acts chapter eight, verse three says this. It says, but, but Saul began to destroy the church Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. This was an evil man. How evil this man was when we really consider the things that he did. He went from church to church to drag off men and women and throw them in prison. This wasn't a man that you wanted to have for supper, you know, and you know, open up with all your ideas on life. You didn't want to do that with Paul. But the interesting thing is, is that Saul, not Paul, Saul did all of this in the name of God. All of his evilness he did in the name of God. And some of the most evil men in the history uh, of this world have used God's name to carry out their evil, right? We see some very evil men that do it, that, you, that, uh, 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 that carry out their evilness in the name of God. And Saul didn't kill Christians. He didn't imprison Christians for any type of self-gain. He thought he was doing righteous works. He thought he was doing the will of God. You know, and it sounds a lot like our news today, right? You know, he thought that uh, through all his studies and through all the knowledge and wisdom that he had obtained through his religion, that he was doing those righteous works. And you know, there's people today that think that they're doing the will of God 
by forcing his agenda, by forcing things to happen, by making uh, things happen. And any time that we have to force things, anytime we have to force a situation, it's usually a good indication that it's not from the Lord. When it doesn't just happen naturally, when God doesn't just allow things to fall into place, it's usually a good indication that, hey, maybe this is of my flesh. Maybe I should go back and pray about this a little bit more, seek after the Lord and ask him to do something here. Saul's story continues on in, the, in uh, Acts chapter nine. And uh, again, while on the road to Damascus, the Lord uh, knocks him to the ground and he blinds him for three days, right? And a Christian that's in the area, a disciple it says by the name of Ananias, is told to go visit Saul, right? And uh, you could just imagine being in Ananias' shoes, Ananias wanted to confirm, reconfirm with the Lord if this is the man that he was speaking of. Lord, are you sure? And in Acts 9, 13 through 15, this is what Ananias answered the Lord. He said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. And Ananias says, Lord, are you sure? Are we talking about the same guy? You know, I don't want to go and knock on the, on the wrong door here. Oh, you meant the other Saul, you know? You know, Paul goes on in Galatians here in chapter one to give that brief summary of the next few years following his conversion And after three years, he goes to Jerusalem and he sees Peter and the other apostles and he heads out on his first missionary journey around the region there. And it says that he first went to Syria and Cilicia, uh, two regions that you'll find uh, before Galatians that Paul went to. In verse 22 and 23, read with me, Paul says, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. They didn't know what Paul looked like physically, but they definitely knew what Paul's past looked like. They definitely knew the type of man that Paul was and Paul's past was a past that was void of the grace of God. Paul's past was one that relied solely on works solely on what he could do for the Lord and had nothing to do with what God had already done for him. And when Paul realized that he didn't have to do anything to obtain God's grace, it knocked him to his butt, literally, right? He fell to the ground and he got up a changed man. He got up changed by this grace. Has grace changed you? Can you sit here and say honestly that the grace of God has changed you? That it has affected the way that you think? That it's affected the way that you respond to others? The way that you love? The way that you react? The judgment that you have? The acronym for grace again is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches. He's given us everything. He's given us his riches. He's given us his righteousness. And he didn't even make us pay for it. He paid everything for it. Paul, you know, according to his way of thinking, should have beat himself with a thousand lashes, right? He should have beat himself to receive that forgiveness from the Lord the way he thought. It's called flagellation or, or self-mortification. It's the, it's the beating of the flesh. You know, Paul and, uh, or Martin Luther Uh, used to practice this way of thinking and a lot of the men there in his era there in the 15th century they would beat themselves in order to receive uh, uh, the forgiveness of sin and this is what it says about Martin Luther it says that while whipping himself climbing the stairs on his knees trying to desperately gain favor imagine that climbing stairs on your knees because you wanna put your body through anguish and pain because of the sin that you've had. It says, while climbing these stairs, uh, desperately trying to gain favor, when he was halfway up, remembered Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. 
The just shall live by faith. Martin Luther said that the book of Galatians was one of the most influential books in his life. It was one of the most influential books in the Bible that changed his way of thinking and really brought forth the Reformation in the church because of the grace that was found uh, in the Lord and through the Apostle Paul. And really, it was one of the most influential books as well in Paul's life, right? That grace that was found. It was the forgiveness of sin and the ability to forgive others unconditionally. Unconditionally, why? Because of the unconditional love that we have received, that God has given to us. It's that grace that God gives us that allows us to turn and have grace on others. You know, they used to beat themselves in order to try to earn forgiveness and God says, nope, here's that forgiveness for you, free of charge. He even says, I'll take the beating. I'll take the beating for it. And I don't know about you, but that makes me pretty happy. I don't have to go through all these things. I don't have to jump through hoops and beat myself and, you know, uh, you know, a thousand Hail Marys and all this and that. Lord, you did it all already? What an amazing gift from the Lord. And although we don't usually beat ourselves anymore as Christians, I hope nobody in this room is doing that, you know, but many times we still treat our Christianity in the same manner. You know, we still think that we have to try to earn status within the church, or within the Lord. We still have to earn forgiveness, you know, or earn acceptance or earn salvation. And though coming to God in grace and being saved uh, through faith, we tend like the Galatians to run back to works, thinking that they are doing us any good for the Lord. In John uh, chapter 6, 28 and 29, it says this, then they said to him, Speaking of Jesus, it says, what shall we do? Speaking of a crowd as they came to Christ, they asked him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. That's all you have to do. Jesus, what do we have to do to do these works that we see your disciples doing? that we see the awesome things that you're doing, Jesus. And Jesus says, you don't have to do anything but believe in me. What must we do to be saved? Believe in Jesus. What must we do to do the works of God? Believe in Jesus. How can I have a better life? Believe in Jesus. How can I find peace? Believe in Jesus. How can I do something amazing for the Lord? Just believe in Jesus. He'll do it all. He'll do the rest. All you have to do is make yourself available. Lord, here I am, Lord. Just show up and he'll do the rest. He'll change you in his perfect timing as he changed Paul, as he changed Paul. Galatians 1, 24, again, let's read it. It says, and they glorified God in me. Why did God not change Paul as a youth, as a child, before the damage was done, before the, the Christians imprisoned, before Stephen's death? Why didn't God just, you know, do something there with Paul before all of this stuff went on? I think the reason is right here, verse 24, and they glorified God in me. It was Paul's past. It was Paul's testimony that allowed men and women and even us today to glorify the Lord and say, man, this is an awesome God. This is a good, good father. That he can take somebody like Paul that has this past, this type of lifestyle and change him by the grace of God into Paul the apostle. What a great God. I could imagine their excitement in that day, right? To know that Saul the murderer, Saul the condemner, Saul, you know, the, the judge and the jury, that he's now a believer. Not in God. Remember, Saul was always a believer in God. Saul was always a believer in God, but that now he was a believer in Jesus. He's now a believer in grace and in the grace of God. And if God can change a man like Saul, then nobody is out of God's reach, amen? God can do anything. God can change even the hardest of hearts. We're gonna have the worship team come up right now and, and they're gonna go ahead and end us in a song. And I just wanna encourage you guys this morning, be changed by the grace of God. Allow God's um, unconditional love to affect you in a way that you literally just surrender 
to God. That is all he's asking. God's grace is so amazing that we don't have to do anything. We don't have to do something to receive forgiveness. We don't have to show up at any of the ministries that were, that were in the announcements. You don't even have to be here on time, you know? You guys are like, amen. We can show up late and God still loves us. And that's the grace that we find in the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, God. We thank you, Father, that you are a God that loves us unconditionally, that you haven't placed conditions upon our lives, that you have given us this new covenant that we find through your cross, Lord. And I pray, Father, right now that if anybody is in this room, Lord, anyone in this room has not received your grace, they've never accepted you as their Lord and Savior and just surrendered to you, Father, we pray right now that they would have a heart of surrender, Lord. And I pray that if that's you, that you would just simply say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Forgive me of every uh, evil thing that I have ever done and cover me with your righteousness. I know I don't have to do anything other than believe in you. And I pray that that belief and that work that you did on the cross would give me that salvation that I've been searching for. God, we just thank you, Father, once again for your grace and your love, and we pray all this in your name, amen.